Hey, what's up? This is Coach Stokes, Stokes House Boxing Academy. You got to stay ready so you ain't worry about getting ready. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to Coach Stokes' Champion Creed podcast, where we go into the minds of champions and those who guide them to success. I'm your host, Coach Stokes, and today we're honored to have Adrian Clark from Dallas, Texas, a former amateur boxer turned professional boxing manager and advisor. Adrian founded Protect Yourself at All Times to educate professional boxers on the intricacies of the business. And with his vast experience managing fighters like Jerry Belmontes, James De La Rosa, and my good friend Willie Monroe Jr., Adrian brings a wealth of knowledge to the table. Get ready to uncover the secrets of navigating the boxing world, both inside and outside the ring. My man, Mr. Uh, Adrian, how you doing today, brother? I'm good, Coach. How are you, man? Thank you for having me. No, thank you for accepting, man. I appreciate you. Um, can you please let everybody know what inspired you to transition from boxing into boxing management and advisement? Uh, I, I fought in the amateurs in college. Uh, I was getting my undergraduate degree down in Texas A&M, down in Corpus Christi, and I uh, was mentoring these kids at this, this boxing gym. And uh, my brother and I used to box when, when I was coming up. We used to fight. We wasn't boxing. We were fighting. And um, these, the kids wanted me to, to get in the Golden Glove tournament. And I was like, you know, I'm 21 years old, two years removed from almost graduating. I'm like, you know what? Why not? So... I got in the tournament and my first year I did pretty good. I, think I, I lost in the semifinals and I'm thinking, okay, this could probably be something. But um, my last year, man, I, I ended up getting knocked out in the first round, man. I got knocked out in like 30 seconds uh, against Timothy Tipton. Hit me with a right hook I didn't see coming. Okay. And man, I don't remember getting hit. I don't remember hitting the ropes. I don't remember clinching. I just remember snapping back into it and the ref was like, yo, like walk to me. I'm like, yo, what happened? I tried to take a step and I stumbled, man. And he called a fight. And uh, my, my college roommate, everybody was there. And I'm like, yo, what? What happened? They showed me the video. And I was like, damn. Like, nah, you know what? I love boxing, but I think I'm better suited on the, the business side Thanks, of man. things. So, yeah, <laughs> a, right, a right hook. Timothy Tipton's right hook knocked me into the business side of boxing, man. So I, I, I told myself, I didn't go to school five years to get uh, punch in the head for a living and not remember what happened. So right. that's what got me on the, the business side of boxing. Okay, okay, okay. How do you define success for a boxer beyond their performance in the ring? That's a that's actually a great question, man. And honestly, and it's, I'm not saying it's this because it's the topic of conversation. I feel like once you've got the proper education on what this business is, Mm -hmm. That's when 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 you're really going to see success because you're going to know how to move in the industry. You're going to know how to move away from bad contracts or you're going to understand that, OK, I can't just sign this because someone's throwing money in my face. For me, that's when you know, OK, like I'm definitely successful and it's not the money is not doesn't make you a success. It's the educational piece and you understanding what you're getting into that's when you're really successful because the moves you're going to make will lead to greater success, whether it's financial or materialistic things, the education and learning the business and what to do and what not to do. That's when you're a success, when you really understand that. Adrian, let me ask you this. Um, this younger generation compared to when we were coming up and even way before us, um, are they more educated today than, than, than the fighters in the past? You know, when it comes to, them financially and getting money I'll, I'll be honest i don't believe so because okay. it's like a cycle that you see over and over again like boxing is one of the, the the main sports of a fighter can make a little bit of money or so so we think and then when it all comes down like there's a report a year or so after they're retired that uh the fighter is destitute or broke or you know filing for bankruptcy so i don't believe that the fighters today are, are smarter. They have access to more, which you would think with the internet and things like that, they would make better decisions or be smarter. But 
they're making the same mistakes that a lot of the fighters in the past who did not have the access to whether it would be further education for for business uh, of boxing or business of whatever uh they have a lot more these days but they don't take advantage of the education they just chase the fast money and that's why they end up like the fighters in the past so to answer the question uh no i don't i don't feel like they are are smarter they honestly they had a more privileged advantage and they're not taking advantage of it right 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 which is definitely uh <laughs> a major negative because if you have access to it but you're looking for all the wrong things you and i both know man you're going down a, the the wrong hole yeah you know? yeah most definitely most definitely and, and, and adrian in your experience what is the biggest financial pitfall for professional boxers taking money up front taking too much money up front to 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 stunt or like flex on social media but not understanding i just posted a video of um uh, the movie All Eyes on Me was Suge Knight and, uh, and Tupac. And the scene was Tupac had fulfilled his contractual obligation of three albums, things of that nature. But um, you know, Suge told him, like, Yo, I, I thank you, man. You came in on fire. But he was like, like I'm going to show you something. And he pulled out this black book. And the black book was all the money that Tupac owed to Death Row, whether it was for an advancement for a house or a car or whether the company bought him a car, clothes, jewelry, all of the stuff that Tupac, a young Tupac at that, thought was free, thought that the company was just buying this and giving it to him. He didn't understand or didn't take the time to educate himself that I owe, like, they're not doing this for free because I'm selling, like, multi-platinum albums. This is a tab that I'm starting and he couldn't. He could not leave death row because he had such an um, outstanding balance of what he owed. So what I see with most fighters is the same format, essentially, of they get with someone and they are taking things, taking money, taking trips, accepting things that is just creating a tab for them not to be able to leave the individual that they're with, uh, whether it be managerial-wise or advisory-wise, because they've accepted so much money that they assumed was free and nothing is free in this world. So that's the biggest mistake that I see. You, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that nothing is free. You, you fighters, please understand nothing is free. You, it is always going to be something, you know, whatever they give you. Um, just to payback on that. Uh, remember the new edition story. Yeah. You remember, remember how they were just, they would leave the country and they always come back to the hood, to the ghetto. And it was like, yo, their parents yeah. was like, what's up with the money? What's going on? Because they was, <laughs> yeah. it was building up that tab, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then again, and it's also, man, that it's a responsibility on, on the parents. You have to be very present because, you know, we may think uh, he's 18, 19, 20, 20, while he's grown. It's like, yeah, in terms of like the age, the legal system, like, yeah, like you're, you can be charged or tried as an adult, but 19, 20, 20 you're still a kid in so many ways because you're still making childish decisions unless you are educated in regards to the business that you're in. So the parents, it, it can't just be a situation where you're just sitting back like, oh, well, you know, we're just going to hope for the best. And no, there's, there's information out there now for you to educate yourself on the business of boxing. And it's a, in a book called Protect Yourself at All Times. I, I think I did a, a solid job of um, whether, regardless of what your education is. And I don't like to write long books. Each chapter, two to three pages, right to the point of what you need to know about signing contracts, um, signing with a promoter, signing with a manager, accepting money from a manager, paying taxes, things that you know you, you think as a citizen you should know, but a lot of fighters get caught up with just not paying taxes, man. So um, the, 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 just as the fighters need to know what's going on, the parents of the fighters should be on top of things also. I had a question for you. How should uh, an aspiring champion um, protect himself from those crooked promoters and managers that are out there? Honestly, it, it goes with what we're doing right now, what you're doing right now, asking the right questions or asking questions in general. There's no such thing as a dumb question when it comes to business. I don't care how smart or how smart you think someone is. 
you you can ask them anything in regards to your business. Um, and let's just let's play an example. If you were looking to sign me as uh, a man, uh, as a fighter, you're a manager, I'm the fighter, and you're telling me, okay, you know what? You sign this contract, man. You know, we'll we'll, we'll give you we'll give you three thousand dollars like for this. If I'm in a situation where I need the money, like before I'm taking it and signing it, I'm asking, okay, is this like a bonus? Is this something that you're giving me, or is this something that I'm gonna have to pay back later on? Then I'm I'm looking at, okay, well, since you're advancing me or giving me this money as a bonus, how does that change your managerial fee? What is your managerial fee, and how long will I have to be in this contract based off of this money? I would also ask you. If I don't take the money, if I don't take the money, can we negotiate the years on this contract down? Can we negotiate your percentage? Can we negotiate that down? Those are questions that you have to ask in the beginning because most guys get caught up in, damn, I need the money. I just need the money. If somebody comes with the money and you blindly sign the contract and all of a sudden, all right, the money's spent. And now you're signed, you're locked into a five-year contract that has two years of extensions in the contract based off of your success inside the ring. And now that you've taken this money, now 15% percentage of the service for the manager turns into 25% mm -hmm. of, of what you're going to make going forward. So uh -huh. those are things that you have to be keen on and ask those questions and put people on the spot. Don't just look at the money and take it just because you need it. Uh, the, the the life of a fighter is a struggle as is. So if you got to go a couple more months or whatever it may be, struggling a bit more, then, then so be it. But don't just jump to the money and blindly sign things. That's where fighters end up um, on the wrong side. You um you have a lot of fighters. You and I both know they come from, you know, uh, um, poverty stricken areas, uh, and a lot of their coaches, uh, you know, uh, sadly to say, a lot of them aren't educated as well. So, who do they, who do they go to? You know, because a lot of them don't know. They don't know. I mean, I, I, me, me and my wife talk about this because she, she's in USA boxing as well, and she's like, you know what? A lot of these coaches don't even want to get educated on the new rules and regulations. You know, they don't read books. They don't, you know, they, they still outdated. They still doing things from the seventies and the eighties, unfortunately. And that's nothing to, to laugh about, man, but it's sad. It's sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, 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 I, I understand what you're saying, but how can we do better as a whole? Because this, the, the box boxing is, is, is one of the most cricketed sports that you can get into. Well, I mean, just that uh, you mentioned USA boxing and, you know, I've I've I partnered with USA Boxing 2000. I want to say that was 21, I believe it was 2021. I partnered with them and I, I showed up to the national tournament and I passed out, I think, 800 books, like 800 Protect Yourself at All Times books for free to the coaches and to the, the, the fighters that were there. But I believe USA Boxing, they are on the forefront like before you get to professional boxing, you have to go through USA Boxing. And I voiced to 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 Matt Johnson. I'm sorry, did my phone go off? No, it's a phone call. No, you're good. Can you, can you still hear me? I can. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, my my phone's hard ringing, but um, um, I I voiced to Matt Johnson and I voiced to 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 Mike Campbell that you USA Boxing should do a better job of providing an educational system for the coaches and for the fighters coming through that system. Because the more the fighters know, the more they learn early, it better prepares them for the professional ranks. And yeah. I feel that USA Boxing does a horrible job of taking care of their entire system, their membership. They, of course, look out for the high performance team. But when it comes to the entire system, their entire network of coaches and trainers, teaching the business of boxing, teach and preparing fighters and even the coaches who may become managers later on, preparing them and giving them the information they need to know. USA Boxing does a horrible job of that. And, um, you know, we didn't continue on with our partnership, but it wasn't because of me. It was more so because of, I don't think USA Boxing either saw the value in it or they thought that the more the high performance team knew about the professional side of boxing, 
the more prone they will be to turn pro and like, nah, I'm going to tell you the truth. And honestly, you better stay amateur for a little bit longer because I, like, it's a big change. It's a huge transition. And if you're not prepared, it's not a jump that you should make just because you want to turn pro. Something that um, we would definitely talk um, a little bit down the length in this interview when it comes to, you know, uh, once they turn pro, because they feel, and I tell a lot of fighters this, if you can't handle the, the roughness or the political aspect when it comes to amateur boxing, pro is a whole nother world, my brother. Yeah. Yeah. Whole nother world, man. And notice that when a, a guy or girl turns pro from the amateurs, like the transitional process in the NBA, when those rookies get picked up by a team, it, it, even if you don't get picked up and you, you go to um, a veterans camp, like there's a symposium that they do. They're, they're talk, they have other players, older players, retired players come in and talk to the younger guys about, you know, what's next. There is a transitional process that they go to go through in boxing. There is no transitional process that they go through. It's just you get your license and your, your coach kind of holds your hand through the entire system. But now the, the, the entire um, process, but now money is involved. So with money involved, everyone is moving a bit different because everybody want to get their just due or they want to get their pay for the time that, that, that they're putting in, man. And uh, money changes people and money changes people uh, in this sport more than, than anything. So um, USA Box has to do a better job. But us as individuals, man, us as individuals, the fighters, the, the trainers, the parents, you got to want the education if, if you don't seek it out because it's there now. Like before protect yourself at all times, there was nothing on the internet that could help you understand the business of what you're getting into as a professional fighter. Now you have the book. Now you have the the documentary. You have things on YouTube that you can go check out that I'm just, I'm giving it to you essentially from the book. It's 1099 for the book and on YouTube it's free. Like go take the time to get the education. There's no excuse at this point. That's what I'm saying. There's no excuse to, to no. not know. None, none at all, none at all. Who, um, what advice do you give the boxers regarding investing their earnings wisely? Now, when it comes to that, like I, I didn't go to school for like, uh, like financial advisement or, or investing in stocks, bonds, companies, anything of, of that nature. So I am very careful with me giving advice to, uh -huh. to the fighters. I'm, I more so point them in the direction of the professionals that I know that that's their expertise, that that's what they do. Uh, but I, 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 I tell them something that Jay Prince told me uh, a few years ago, it's best you understand your money first before you put it in the hands of someone else mm. to understand for you, understand your money first, understand the responsibility of having money or, or, or making money first then once you understand that, then you can start looking to invest uh, and do other things. But you got to understand it yourself first before put it in the hands of somebody else. No, uh, Jay Prince. Uh, shout out to Jay Prince, man. He's he's one of the big dogs in the game, you know, right now. And I love what he's doing. Definitely when it comes to uh, when it comes to managing these guys. Um, Adrian. What are the signs or what are some signs that boxers should be aware of? Uh, when it comes to those, 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 before, be, be, before they become victims, you know, you understand what I'm saying? So what are some, mm -hmm. some sure signs that, that, you know, if they're talking to somebody where it's like, you know what, uh, that's a red flag right there because I, I feel like you, you, you're manipulating me. You're taking advantage of me. No, oh, that's, that's, that's really easy. Like the, sometimes knowing the past can help dictate the future or help you see the future better. So if I'm a fighter and there's a manager approaching me looking to sign me, I don't want to just hear the names of the guys that you used to quote unquote work with. Like, what does that mean? Like you brought up Willie Monroe. Like I could have said, Oh, you know, I, I work with Willie Monroe, but if you can't read a press release of, of Willie doing an interview or me doing an interview or us on television together, if you can't see nothing of Willie Monroe and I working together, that should be a huge red flag of weight. He told me that he worked with Willie Monroe, but on the internet, I can't find nothing that pairs him and Willie Monroe 
together. Something's wrong with that. And and now with social media, you can reach out to Willie Monroe directly on Instagram right. and be like, hey, man, like, do you know Adrian Clark? And, and if so, you know, what can you tell me about him? So with, with fighters these days, it goes with the, the questions, man. Like, and you have to really pay attention on, okay, you know, who have you worked with? And they start throwing out names. It's your responsibility to do your due diligence to um, go on the internet and see if this person really did work with this individual for how long or whatever. And then you can reach out to certain fighters now that will confidently respond to you and let you know the good and the bad of working with someone. So um, the red flags are going to be there with everyone. I mean, I, I think that that Jay Prince is the the best manager in the game aside from, from Jolene Mazzone, but there's probably some red flags that you may hear or see on Jay Prince. It's on you to do your own research on that. Same thing with Jolene Mazzone. Like, you can go do your research and you may not like something that you may see or whatever, or you can read something and be like, okay, I'm going to ask her about this to get clarity on it. So uh, anything you see, anything you hear, all those things can be discussed before you move forward. But um, this is just looking at someone's past can help you dictate how your future will look with them moving forward. Boxes, at the end of the day, do your homework, research. It's not all about getting in there and, and, and punching and hitting and not, and, 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 and not get hit. It's all about as much more than that. I'm telling you, man, do your research. <clears throat> How do you assess the potential of a young boxer to reach the championship level? Well, honestly, like, like nobody has a crystal ball, but you know, some guys skill level, like you can see in the amateurs, like they just, they just have it. Like Errol Spence in the amateurs, you just knew based off of the, the jab that he threw and his defense, like you just knew that he had it. Um, like Terrence Crawford went kind of overlooked, you know what I'm saying, as, as an amateur. He was decorated, but he wasn't on the Olympic team or whatever. Cameron Duncan, like God rest his soul, he saw something in Terrence Crawford that had him get behind him. So everybody has a different eye, man, um, in regards to who's going to be a world champion, who's not. And then a lot comes with world championship status. Like you need to be with a a prominent promoter, whether it's top rank or golden boy or match room or um, associated with, with premier boxing champions and, and their, their entire regime. Like you need to be with the, the right people and have the right manager uh, maneuvering you the, the right way. It's not just about, cause there's a lot of guys that um, have great skill that were great in the amateurs, but they, they didn't become world champions. And then you have guys that, uh, were great in the amateurs that, you know, just they, it didn't pan out or they didn't make it to a world championship. And then you have guys like Gabe Rosado. Gabe Rosado had an illustrious career. He may have had, I think, 11 or 12 losses, but Gabe Rosado probably made just as much money as a lot of world champions out here, and he diversified his career. So a lot of times, man, it's not about, don't get me wrong, having the goal of world championship, like, that's that's cool. I never try to deter any guys uh, from like having that that aim but most people don't know like it, it costs to fight for a world championship it's three percent right. of your purse right. to fight for a world championship so it's like even you're unifying you can try to negotiate down but you're still paying you're still paying to be the champion and every time you defend your belt you're paying to remain champion which to me is the dumbest thing ever but that's another conversation, but I, I would tell the fighters, man, just it's it's important. If it's important for your goals to be a world champion, man, stay on that, stay on that path. However, a lot of people, a lot of fighters became world champion, but like they retired with nothing. They didn't they didn't make any money. They just could say, Oh, I was world champion. But I would rather the fighter, whoever it is, I would rather you retire saying, you know what? I use boxing as a vehicle to get to where I wanted to go next. And I made a good amount of money, a good amount of relationships in the sport of boxing to move on with the second half of my life, which will be in your 30s. You'll be lucky to fight all the way through your 20s, through your 30s and get to 40 and retire. You're going to retire early, man. So I would rather you have the money when you retire than to just say, oh, well, you know, I was – 
two-time world champion but have nothing to show for it but a, a belt that collects dust, I wouldn't want that for any fighter. I agree because I, uh, I was talking to Steve Cunningham uh, the other day, and he says, you know what? He says, Stokes, somebody asked me, would you rather have the belts or would you rather have the money? He said, I'd rather have the money. And this person got, uh, you know, I, you know, I rate. They say, what? What? You the champ, though. You, you the champ. He said, yeah, I'm the champ. But how many fighters have you heard of that have gone into debt? And they, they, they sold their belts. They're doing all types of crazy stuff. He said, but if I got that money, I got that bag. I ain't got to worry about nothing. I ain't got to worry about none of that, man. So can you elaborate a little bit more when it comes to that? Because, you know, when you're young, all you just want to hear is, you know, I want to champ. I want this. I want that. But then, you know, uh, obligations come with that. You know, you never know, you know, you especially if you get a girlfriend or, you, you know, you got family members, whatever the situation may be. But can you elaborate a little bit more when it comes to that? There's a clip, you know, Mike Tyson. That they did an interview with Mike Tyson, and, and he was in his uh, in his house, and he was showing like all the belts and stuff like that. And the re the reporter, a guy that's that's not in the business, he was like, "Man, like this is this is history. Like this is great stuff." And Mike was like, "Man, this is garbage." You know what I'm saying? And, and the guy was like, "Wait, like this doesn't mean anything to you?" And Mike responded, "At one point in time, when I was younger, when I was a kid, like it did. Which you know, your younger years, that's what you." trained for like to be world champion but this is a business man boxing is a business yes it's it's labeled as a sport but don't get it twisted this is a business and again history has shown us time and time again that this sport doesn't uh they don't um Pulp Fiction is one of my favorite movies and uh Marcellus Wallace character in the movie it's like boxers don't have an old Thomas day bro like they're not they're not setting up pensions and things of that nature, retirement for you once you're done with the sport, for them to keep sending you checks. You can win all the belts uh, in, in, in the in the sport. You can be unified, but the WBC ain't sending you no pension or retirement check because you held their belt for six years or whatever it may be. They'll, they'll, they'll collect your sanction fee for six years, but you won't see none of that money back, bro. So I'm not... Um, it's not the point of I'm talking down on the... The, the belt sanctions, I think becoming a world champion is good. It, it increases your value. But again, you have to pay to fight for it. You have to pay to keep it. To def Every time you defend your belt, you have to pay money. If nobody thinks that's criminal, they need to be slapped. Yeah. Every time you defend it, you have to pay for it. Right. That doesn't make any sense. So if you want to be world champion, man, keep striving for it, but do not put the belts before the money. That that does not make logical sense. Do not put the belts before the money. I don't care what fans say. I don't care what your promoter says. I don't care what your manager says. The money is always worth more than the belts. Yeah, you want to fight for your legacy, but you can have a great legacy without becoming a world champion and look no further than guys like Gabe Rosado. Great legacy in the sport of boxing. He'll always be remembered as an entertaining guy that fought his heart out every single fight and gave you a show. But I don't think we'll be reading about, ah, Gabe Rosado is, you know, he lost it all because he didn't make a lot of money from the sport of boxing. Um, no, I think Gabe is going to be good. So the money's always before the, the belts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you share a memorable um, experience where you had to intervene and help a boxer, uh, a boxer's uh, interest? When it comes to you know uh, to to protecting their boxers' interests, a lot of stories. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of stories, man. I've yeah, I've helped out so many fighters, man. So many guys. I've had the privilege of working with whether it's guys, world champions, guys that are multimillionaires, guys that are um, just starting out. I, I've helped out so many people. Um, I guess I'd have to start with my first client, uh, Jerry Belmontes, because that's where it all started. And before I before I thought of protect yourself at all times, before I knew anything about the business of boxing, I was 24 years old, and um, we were we were in a contract dispute. He just he hired me when I was 23, and I was fresh out of college. I honestly didn't know nothing about the business of boxing. I just. I was advanced in regards to things that I knew. And I was living with an NBA player 
Um, so I had some time on, on, on my hands. And um, the one thing I did, <laughs> he was signed to a local level promoter and it was a horrible contract. And the, the promoter didn't want to work with me or reconstruct the contract. So I'm nagging this guy every day, getting on his nerves, sending him letters, reporting him to the commission. I'm doing whatever I can to get his attention to try to change this contract. So one day he's like, I'm sick of you. Like, you know, I, I'll, I'll give him his release. I just want my, I want my $3,000 back that I gave him. And, you know, Jerry ended up fighting for a world title. Like Jerry made some good money in the sport of boxing, but he wouldn't have been able to do that had he just stayed in his contract with this lower level promoter. So I did, I stuffed, uh, I stuffed $3,000 cash in a backpack, which, don't ever do that. <laughs> Even though you know, I, back in two, back in two thousand and ten, I think it was eleven. Um, uh, I was living in Utah, and I, I took a flight down to uh, Harlingen, in Texas, which is like close to Mexico, with three thousand dollars stuffed in my backpack. I can only imagine how that would look these days. But I remember sitting down with the man, and he had one of his friends count the money, and he signed the release of the contract. Um, and that's sometimes you have to, I was a young man doing that, but sometimes, bro, that's, you, you have to go to that limit or th go to that, um, that extreme to look out for a fighter. Cause that $3,000 turned into a lot of money that Jerry Belmonte has made for his freedom to go with the bigger promoter, which he ended up signing with main events. Then he went to golden boy. He was able to make money and then fight freely being away from that promoter. But that was one of like the, the coolest things that I've, I've done uh as as a manager and i did it at a very young age man didn't think too much about it i just went for what i thought was right and um it was history but i was just glad to be able to do that and, and get my man free you was ready to go though i i, I could i could tell you probably was like yo <laughs> let's do this man like this yeah. is something that you know i'm i'm really i'm really egging on to do so uh, i i know he was very thankful to have you in his corner during that time yeah man it was, that was a good time that was a fun time for us and it it goes by so fast, Coach, man, because we both were young. I was 23, 24. He was 21. And we really learned the business together. We grew together, man. And then before I knew it, like, I was planning, like, a retirement press conference in his hometown. I'm like, this, this just doesn't seem real, man, but it goes by so fast, man. Super dope. That's super dope. What strategies do you employ to negotiate fair contracts for your fighters? Um, I like I like the the client being a part of like the negotiation. Um, I tell a quick I try to tell a quick story. James De La Rosa was fighting David Lemieux, and we were fighting in Canada. Wow. David Lemieux came in like four pounds overweight, and then he started rehydrating at the scale. I'm like, wait, what, like what, like what are you doing? Like you didn't make weight. It was this crazy thing. So, um, media was involved. Uh, his promoter was saying different things. And I'm like, you know what? I have a choice to make right now. I could go get a little bit more money and then James will go into a fight with already a heavy puncher. David Lemieux was like knocking cats out. Oh, yeah. He went rough. Yeah. I'm like, all right, that wouldn't be looking out for like my client. So I did. I'm like, you know what? Yo, we're going to walk. Like, like, we ain't fighting. Like, go, I told James to go back to the hotel. And I'm like, yo, if y'all really trying to get a deal done, like, meet me back at my hotel. Like, we can talk about it. So I knew if I didn't have James at the negotiation table with me, listening to what I was saying, the promoter and his team could go spin anything to the media. So I invited James, his father, his trainer, and his wife to be at the negotiation table. We were trying to make that fight happen. And the money that I was asking for to make the fight happen, they thought was extremely outrageous. So they walked away from the negotiation table and the fight didn't get made. So we went to Canada for nothing, and we came back with nothing. Uh, but what was key was that my client and his family knew, like, this dude not only went to bat for us, but he included us in the negotiation so we could hear everything that was being said back and forth, and we weren't left in the dark. And we, we made the final decision on, no, we're not going to take this fight, and that was it. So I like involving... Um, my, my clients and the parents, not in all of the negotiations, but some things it needs to just be myself or Jolene doing it. But for the most part, I like to, to have my clients 
in the know about everything. That way it kind of eases their mind on, you know, who's really working for them and what we're doing. Good. That's good because, uh, you know, like someone like my wife, my wife is all into the mix. So she's going to be right there and hearing everything. But like you said, there's sometimes where it's like, you know, you only you you have to do those things, you know, yourself. You know, right. uh, they you know they probably shouldn't even be there or don't even. There's no need need to know. So, yeah. what resources or support systems do you recommend to boxers looking to educate themselves about the business side of the sport? Now, I know you have your book, but any are there any other resources that you would recommend? There's nothing else out there. <laughs> there's literally. Wow nothing else out there. And I'm, I'm 37 years old. I came into the business when I was 23 years old within that time frame, like literally the only thing that's changed, the only thing that's been introduced is protect yourself at all times and the work that I've put in. And even with that, it's been straight grassroots marketing. Like no major publication has picked this up to say, Hey, you know, people need to pay attention to this USA boxing. And I had one year, not even one year, we had a one day partnership to where I passed out books at, at one of their events. Um, no one is, no one cares. And I, I'll, I'll be frank with you. Aside from the fighters and their families, no one cares about if the fighters get it or understand, or people just want to see a good fight. That's what they want to see. That's all they care about. And if the fighters go broke or whatever, no one cares aside from the fighters and their families. So, um, yeah, but there's there's no other, and that's why there's no other resource that's out there because really no one cares and no one thinks to put in the work to actually uh, put things out there, other resources out there to help the fighters uh, further protect themselves. So protect yourself at all times is what you have for now. Hopefully, um, you know, things pick up and maybe other people get creative with their approach on putting information out there, but as of right now, protect yourself at all times is the only educational resource out there that's for amateur or professional fighters. Adrian, why is that though? My wife and I talk about that because you know you see a lot of they don't have anything like that NBA or NFL or MLB where it's like you know, like you say, you play a certain time, then you you get money, you know, for the rest of your life or whatever case may be. They don't have any of that. You know, you got cats that can barely get um insurance, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh uh uh. God forbid a guy, he doesn't have any insurance and then like he gets cut, you know, depending on the promoter, the promoter may be like, you're going to have to have, have to handle that yourself or you have to drive yourself to the hospital or, you know, he can't get stitched up. But why is that? Is that because they feel like. Almost man, for real, real talk, man, it feels like it's a slave mentality to me when it comes to that, you know, just how, how, how they treat these fighters, because, you know, these fighters, they putting their life on the line and you and I both know a great majority of these fighters don't even go in inside the ring at a hundred percent you know they're getting injured in training camp things may happen but why why don't they want to educate i know why i know i know why but you know well i mean at, at the end of the day you know nba and you know some of my videos i think people get the mindset because i see some of the comments and people get so focused on when i say boxing doesn't have an athlete union or a council but first of all NBA players, MLB, NHL, those are all W-2 employees. They're employed by the, the leagues or they're contracted by the teams. They're employees. They may be larger than life athletes, but LeBron James is employed by the National Basketball Association. In right. boxing, they're all independent contractors. If you're signed with a promoter or a manager, I guarantee you at the end of your contract, it talks about um, your taxes are paid like by you because you are an independent contractor. So there's no union for independent contractors. Unions are only for employees. So anybody out there, I'm not saying that protect yourself at all times as a union or I'm looking to form a union. I'm just simply stating that like boxing doesn't have a union because these guys are independent contractors. They're not like NBA players that are employees of the, the the league essentially um and and that's the reason why a lot of things are done the way that they are because like the fighters are independent contractors mayweather canelo andre ward all those guys independent contractors all the fighters now you're an independent contractor you are a business yourself so yeah they're not gonna boxing 
<laughs> which has no association or any type of league, boxing is not going to provide education for you. Boxing is not going to provide a union for you. Boxing won't provide any of those things. As independent contractors, it's on you to handle yourself like a business, learn the business, and then move about the business accordingly as a business owner, as a business entity, but don't expect anything from boxing. Boxing is a business slash sport. It's not going to give you anything. So don't expect nothing from it. I think that's the mistake most people make. It's like, oh, well, boxing should do this. And bo no, boxing is doing what boxing does. Right. It's on you guys as the independent contractors, as the parents, um, as the, the trainers, the people that are actually in the camps. It's on your, you guys to educate yourselves and understand that this person, the spider, that's the amateur right now, that's the kid, this person's going to grow up <laughs> to make money that he's going to be paying everybody in the circle. Your manager, you're getting paid by the fighter. You don't get paid if the fighter doesn't fight. You're the trainer, it's great, but you get paid by the fighter. You don't get paid if he doesn't fight. Like everything, the, the, the fighter is the nucleus. The fighter is the business. So once that's understood and the fighter um, can understand that and learn and move accordingly, things will get better. But don't expect nothing diddly from boxing. Boxing is doing what boxing does. Um, and as independent contractors, it's on the fighters and their families to learn themselves. Thank you. Thank you for clearing, uh, clearing, clarifying that. What are your um, ethical your ethical considerations when 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 working with a a fighter? You know, I mean, honestly, I honest, I understand. Like as CEO of Fighters First Management, like. I, I directly now don't manage fighters uh, anymore. Uh, Jolene Mazzone is president of, of Fighters First Management, and she manages the seven clients we currently have. Um, we we work for them, and that's something that I helped the fighter understand in the beginning. It's like, bro, like, regardless of this one- to two-page agreement that we have that we're going to provide a service to help your career, and in turn for that service that we're providing uh, our expertise that we're providing, the relationships and the leverage that we're providing for you in negotiation, things of that nature, like it's stating that you are to pay us you know, a, a service fee of whatever the percent uh, may be. At the end of the day, we work for you. Like we give you our advice on what we feel you should do. We get the fight offers, we get the numbers or whatever it may be, but we're working for you. And the moment you feel like we're a disservice to you or we're not doing our jobs or you want to move in a different direction, like just give us 15 day notice. And as long as like you don't owe the company any money, but you can be sayonara. Like you can go about your business and, and go about your career. That's the way that it should be. But I think we're probably the only management company that moves that way. I'm not, I've never been in the business of holding fighters hostage. I don't own nobody. Cause at the end of the day, I didn't start your career. Like I look at my son. My son is five years old now. Like even with him, if he decides to, he's going to choose boxing, which I hope he doesn't, but if he decides this is what he wants to do, like I don't own his career. I may, I'm his dad, so yeah, I'm the one that put the gloves in his hands or whatever it may be. But I don't own his career. He has the the right to pick whoever he wants to pick to uh, to represent his career. But most people have this mindset that they own. The fighters, you talk about the slave mentality. There's a lot of people in this industry that have a slave mentality towards the fighter. They feel like, oh, well, you sign this paper, you got to do what we say. And if you don't do what we say, then we're going to put you on ice. We're not going to get you fights. There's mm -hmm. always a consequence when the fighter doesn't do what um, what you want them to say. And they, they dangle that piece of paper in front of your face as if they own you. But that's why I say be careful about the contracts because if you read them, Essentially, they do own you right. based off of the contract. So it's on the fighters, man, and the families to to be smart. And I get it. Come from my, like, so you need the money or whatever it may be. But man, as an I've been an entrepreneur for 14 years, man. It's what, 13 years. My 14 year, I sold my company and I became an employee of Fighters First Management. So I know what it's like to struggle. I struggled for a decade living below the poverty level. Like for this dream to get to where I'm at right now, I struggled, man, and I, I needed money. And honestly, bro, I, I leaned on my parents. I leaned on my hustle. I diversified myself. 
I started writing books. I, I was training people at one point, man. Like, yo, $20 a pop, I'll give you a package for you. If you want to train for the whole month, like, just give me a thousand up front. You know what I'm saying? I needed that to pay my, my rent. I mm. know what it's like. So I'm not telling y'all something based off of I'm on my high horse and I made all this money or I was born in money. So I'm, I'm telling you all this because it seems smart. Like, no, I lived it. Like, I just wasn't getting punched in the face for a living. I was on the entrepreneur side trying to like figure out how to get through the matrix, bro. But I did, I bet on myself and I didn't take money from people. I just, I expanded my hustle, man, to, I was doing whatever in Boston to try to, you know what I'm saying, just get money to pay the rent, keep the lights on. And I just put myself in position to succeed. And then it took a decade. It took 10 years for me to actually make some money. But looking back on it, bro, Man, I, I would bet on myself. If I could go back, I would bet on myself every day of the week that, you know what, I'm not going to take nothing to let nobody own me. I'm going to just sacrifice, expand my hustle, and it's going to make sense on the back end. I, that's what I encourage fighters to do. Like, don't don't let nobody own you, man. Like, own yourself. I love hearing that. And, and those are the type of individuals um, these fighters need to be attracted to you know uh, i really believe that because if you go with somebody you know like you said you're looking for the quick dime the quick buck you're gonna get what you get you're gonna get that alligator you know yeah. that's what yeah. that's what they say always keep your grass cut short so you can see the snakes coming you know exactly. Exactly. Um, how do you balance excuse me i'm sorry what changes would you like to see in boxing or in the boxing industry to better protect the interests of fighters honestly and a lot of people don't like this because you know it I, if, if this is really going to work, then we, we need to become like the other associated sports to where, like, I know people feel a certain way. Some people like PBC, some people don't. But I would I would like to see the sport become associated and now everything is under one roof. Everything is under one roof. All the promoters are under one roof. That way we can easily see the fights that we want, you know what I'm saying? And it can be done effortlessly. Like, imagine, I always say this, like, imagine in the NBA if, like, the Knicks were like, oh, no, man, we, we, not, we ain't playing the Lakers today. We don't want to play the Lakers. Like, it don't make business sense for us to play the Lakers. Like, under that association, you have no choice. This is what's on the schedule. You'll right. be playing the Lakers. Twice. So I feel like if everything was done under one roof, that way – we can have a union because the fighters, essentially, if you're signed with a promotional company, um, you will become an employee, essentially, so you can have a union for the fighters. There can be a better program from the amateurs, which serves as college for us, for boxers. You can have a program to educate them on what the next level is like, and then there's a smooth transi transitional period. So that's the way I would, I would want to go about it, associate the sport, um, and then have better education, a better transitional process uh, for the amateur fighters going into the professional ranks, and then further educate the managers. I currently have a course that's on teachable.com. It's called uh, the Boxing Manager Certificate. And like it's just all my knowledge bro, I put into this 48-minute course that if you're aspiring to be a manager, at least you know you can go to this course and learn the basics of what it is to be a manager so that way you can hit the ground running in regards to what you need to know because you can't go google anything on what it is to be a boxing manager like it's not going to teach you anything even if you just go get your license through the commission the commission is going to take your money and give you a license but they're not checking nothing they don't care if you know about boxing or not they're going to just give you the license because you're giving them the money so, you know, anybody out there that's looking to become a boxing manager and you want to understand the basics of the business and what it is for you to do to become a successful manager, go take the boxing manager certificate that's on teachable.com. And um, I give a lot of great information on there that can help you transition into a, a solid boxing manager. So they go to teachable.com and then uh, they type in um, what they Bo type boxing in. Exactly? Yeah, boxing manager certificate. Okay. Okay. And the course will come up, man. And it, to me, it's worth the investment. Again, like if I was on the outside looking in and I really wanted to be in this business, it's something that I would do. But I'm also going to, with Fighters First, I'm going to move into providing internships for aspiring boxing managers. So that way, like I want, I want the game to be different uh, once I step out of it completely. And the way I do that is to groom and teach 
aspiring younger managers what they should be doing, how they should do it. So um, whether it's this year or next year, I'm going to get more into focusing on the internships and grooming younger managers, but it's going to go through the boxing manager certificate to be able to intern with us. You'll have to take the boxing manager certificate to, to get on. Ladies and gentlemen, I definitely will put all that information to the, the description after uh, this podcast concludes. My last question to you, brother, is uh, looking back on your journey, what lessons or insights do you wish you had known earlier when it came to your career? I'm going to quote something from um, from Game, and I, I won't I won't use the explicit. Um, if I could if I could start from scratch. I wouldn't change it. Same, same rib. He, I love the way he started that. Cause honestly, if it was for me, I wouldn't change nothing. Like ignorance is bliss. I didn't know how difficult the journey would be. I had no clue. I thought, all right, man, this is going to be easy. I graduated college. So I thought it couldn't get no harder <laughs> than that. But <laughs> if I had known, if someone had told me like, man, entrepreneurship, boxing, no, nah, man. That, that stuff is hard, bro. You don't want to do that. The, the, the sport is corrupt. It's crooked. They're not going to let you in. Like you, You're too young. If someone had told me that, it would have scared me. And I don't know if I would have moved forward. If I had knew how hard entrepreneurship was and that, you know, without a safety net, without the capital, without the money, without the business plan, without so much that it, it's hard to move an inch. Like, if I had known these things, Mm -hmm. Like, I would have been like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, you see how far that mountain looks? I don't know about climbing that. But the fact that I didn't know and that I just follow my passion and my ambition, I'm like, you know what? Like, this is it. Like, I want to be in sports. I want to represent pro athletes. And I just blocked out all the background noise. And I just started moving forward. And before I knew it, I was in too deep. So by the time I called, like, damn, this is, this is really hard. And these people are not letting me in. And they don't care about my education. They don't care about any of this. This is difficult. But I look back like, damn, I've come too far to turn back. So um I wouldn't I wouldn't change nothing, man. I'm 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 glad the education I got and I'm glad that I was like the human sacrifice because my mindset is this ain't just about me. This don't end with me. I'm just the start of the conversation. There's other guys out there, younger guys, maybe my son, who knows there's other people out there that can carry the torch further. So I don't want this to die with me. I want people to be able to look at Adrian Clark or protect yourself at all times. And it's like, or, or even the boxing manager certificate and think, yo, like that's how we move forward. That's how the sport moves forward with that, man. So I, I wouldn't change anything because, um, yeah, the, that shit was hard. Excuse me. It was hard, but it's okay. <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth it, man. <laughs> That's 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 good. That's good to hear. Do you have any um sponsors or any people you like to shout out? Uh definitely shout out to to Everlast. Uh Everlast does a great job of always looking out for me um with sponsorships and taking care of the fighters, um, and taking care of me going to other countries to donate to different gyms or whatever. So shout out to Chris Zawyer and and Adam, uh and Mark Hunter at Everlast, uh Fighters First Management, David Basha. Uh, Jolene Mazzone, uh, the president of Fighters First, and then Desi Martinez, who um, has Desi Martinez Promotions. Uh, he's a great guy that we're looking to groom as a promoter to help us out with our journey of um, bringing something different to the sport of boxing, man. But uh, just shout out to everybody out there, man. Protect yourself at all times. Please go buy the book or go get the audio book or just go to YouTube, man, and just look at those videos of a, a younger, slimmer me, but... Go check out them videos, man. There's a lot of knowledge yeah. on there that I'm I'm just giving out to help you guys move forward, man. But that's all from my end, fam. Definitely, definitely. And um, what are your social media platforms so people can uh, contact you if they want to reach out? So on Instagram, I'm um personally it's AC underscore Clark. Um, feel free to DM me. I I typically always respond to a DM as long. Oh, there's nothing crazy, man. Don't send me no crazy <laughs> requests or nothing like that, man. Um, but reach out to me on there uh, for protect yourself at all times. I believe it's P Y A A T underscore underscore. Um, I have someone running that page, but she'll also respond uh, back in a in a convenient time. And then I don't know the handle to Fighters First Management page, which is probably sad, but 
uh, type in Fighters First Management. And if you Google us, our website will come up and it'll lead you to our social media page. Same thing with Protect Yourself at All Times website. Just type in Protect Yourself at All Times and, and, and everything will come up, man. But uh, just type in the, the words and that's how you find me. Everybody go out, get this book. Uh, once I uh, this uh, interview concludes, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and invest and, and buy this book because I want to read it and uh, get more educated. You know, and have my son read it, my wife read it, everybody in the house needs to read it. You know, if you're within this this realm of boxing, you have to know any and everything, you know, uh, and, and, and study your craft. You're going to be on this, be in this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and support this, brother. Well, okay. thank you for tuning in to Coach Stokes' Champions Creed with our very special guest, Mr. Adrian Clark. We've explored invaluable insights into how champions have can safeguard themselves in the business of, of the world of boxing, avoid becoming targets for predators, make wise investment decisions, um, discern trustworthy individuals in the industry, and strive for championship success. Join us next time as we uncover the wisdom of champions and those who guide them to victory. Until then, keep fighting for your dreams and protecting yourself at all times. Always remember what makes a champion the foods you eat, the times you sleep, the friends you keep, the knowledge you speak, excuse me, the knowledge you seek, and the words you speak. My name is Coach Stokes, and we out. Dope. I like that ending. <laughs>